Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to CGC Central Excel. Uh, we'll be we'll be starting off here in about five seconds. So we will begin with uh, with some trivia questions and then roll into uh, a video from one of our sponsors, IGL, and then we'll move into Guy Leach's presentation. Trivia. First trivia question, I'll give you guys a few minutes to answer. What city was the first parking meter installed? Okay, we got some answers coming in. All right, maybe anybody answered Oklahoma City and looks like looks like Andre got it just in the nick of time. Very good. All right, next question. What city was the first hamburger chain started in? Okay, I see some answers rolling in. <laughs> All right. Got another correct answer here. All right, got some answers, got some really good answers. Uh, Fresno, uh, maybe that was in and out. Um, but the correct answer is Wichita. Okay, so. Thanks everyone for participating uh, in the uh, trivia questions. So now we're gonna move on to our first sponsor, that's iGel. Hi everyone, Mike Barmundi here from iGel. Uh, just wanted to say hello to all of you out there at the CUGC XL, one of my favorite events. Uh, let's just jump into it really quick. I'm going to switch over really quick to a, uh, a screen share so that we can talk a little bit more about what this looks like. So as you can see here, uh, these are really the places where iGel and Citrix work so well together, right? If, if we're talking about workplace challenges like moving to WVD or moving from Windows 7 or even device as a service, right, like a PC, PC refresh, anything with Office or as they call it now, Microsoft 365, mergers and acquisitions, secure remote workplace, the combination of iGel and Citrix really makes a big difference, right? If we start with WVD, you know, Citrix does a great way to secure and optimize the WVD experience with Citrix Cloud, um, making sure that you can manage everything and do those things so succinctly. You know, and iGel really comes, for, comes and helps out, right? Uh, we really are a premier partner for that Linux endpoint to really create a cohesive story end to end. Another one I want to highlight is how we can reduce TCO, right, the total cost of, cost of ownership for you by really helping to understand, you know, the challenge that you're facing today, really the move to more of an operational budget, which this pandemic has really accelerated. Um, and then digital transformation things, right, things like moving to Office 365, mergers and acquisitions, the stuff that's always been hard that are now made harder. So as, as you all may know, um, one of the benefits of iGel is that uh, we're an operating system that could be run on almost any form factor. Again, here's this little device. Um, I'm going to switch video and show you exactly how this works. So I'm going to move over to uh, my webcam here, my other camera. So a whole feature-fledged, full-fledged uh, uh, movie studio here, right? All right. So here I'm, I'm, I'm on a Windows device. So an old Windows PC is actually a, an old Dell Latitude 6430. So all your veterans out there are probably like, wow, that thing is old. And it is, right? So... 
imagine you're a you know a work from home user. This is your device. Maybe it's your personal device, but you want to actually work securely um, with Citrix remotely and iGel. So I'm just going to quickly restart this device, and then um, you can configure the device how you'd like. Uh, you can either you know hit a hotkey or have users you know hit a hotkey to actually do this, or you can do it yourself. Here, I'm just going to quickly just to ensure that <laughs> the demo goes smoothly, right? Uh, just go ahead and choose my iGel device. Again, you can see we can do legacy or UEFI. Go ahead and click that, and you can see up in a second that the iGel workspace will load. So one of the coolest things here is that again you're using a small USB form factor that's really accelerating. Uh, the adoption, security, and cost of you know running your application securely at the edge and your desktops. Um, Citrix does such an amazing job, right, of ensuring how these applications can run remotely, how they can run securely, and iGel really becomes the enabler for that, right? It creates, it takes that last mile of what you're doing uh, with Citrix, and it really takes it all the way into how users use it every day. So you can see here, based on the video, I'm I'm actually into my Citrix workspace. Um, and my iGel, I should say desktop with my Citrix workspace showing. So what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to show you exactly uh, how this works from the iGel end. So I'm going to share my entire screen, and I'm going to go back to uh, what we call our UMS, which is our, which is our management plane. I'm going to show you exactly how this looks. So right here, I'm going to quickly right-click, and I'm going to shadow this device. So this is a great way for uh, uh, your support teams or whatnot to actually um, support users remotely. So you can see it's pulling up there, right? You could probably see it on my video as well. But now I actually have virtual access via VNC um, securely tunneled from uh, this, basically this cloud-based management plane of iGel back into the device, right? Your Citrix work plane is still gonna work the same. This is just mainly an iGel way of supporting an end user. If they have a problem, you can remote in very quickly. So really quick here, I'm just gonna double click on my Citrix workspace. Uh, this is connected to the Citro Citrix demo cloud, so it should pull up my applications uh, relatively quickly in just a moment. And then you'll be able to see that I can uh, I can work away and, and quickly log in, right, with just a couple minutes of plugging in this USB device and, and then getting rolling. So a very quick and easy way to get things going. So you can see here, boom, there's all my applications. So, you know, I can run these and whatnot in, in a very secure manner, depending on what's given to me uh, by your IT departments. So very cool use case. So at this point, right, as a user, right, I can... You can see me. I'm 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 uh, I'm moving the mouse around remotely on the on the mouse pad with the laptop next to me, right? So showing user interaction as well as I can do it here on my screen. So when I'm done, um, I'll quickly uh, swap. I'll stop sharing. I'll I'll swap back to the video really quickly. You can see here when I'm done, I can just pull this out. So you can see it turn off, right? And then I can just quickly boot back up, and it'll it'll actually go right back into Windows. So right, the user experience of how this works is so clean. It's, uh, it works so well, and it really completes that story between you know, working from anywhere uh, with Citrix and how well that Citrix works, all the way down to, hey, what device do you have? You know what? You can, you can pretty much use any device at this point. A major announcement that IGEL broke back in January is the inclusion of running on an end computing device. So if you aren't familiar with this, this is actually a Raspberry Pi wrapper in a company called End Computing that supports it from an enterprise level, right? So I know that uh, Raspberry Pi has been a hot topic for a lot of companies that are wanting to save money on the device aspect. Um, they wanted something like a Raspberry Pi, but maybe they wanted something that they could support, right? That a little bit uh, more uh, support oomph behind it when it comes to actually deploying those. So end, to end computing, um, partnering with iGel, and now we can actually run for the first time ever, right? Drum roll, please. Uh, end computing on Raspberry Pi. Um, that'll be available very shortly and you'll be able to run this um, in your environment along with almost you know, virtually any x86 device. So you have that ability to repurpose a current x86 device, like maybe expensive desktops or laptops, and now you have the ability to bring in um, new cost-effective devices like uh, the end computing uh, Raspberry Pi device. So again, thank you all for your time. Enjoy the CUGC, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. All right, thank you. And next up is, is our presentation. Now will be Guy Leach, who will join us to share his expert knowledge on automating CVAD with PowerShell. Thank you, Tom. Can people hear me? 
it's usually a benefit of these sessions, although some people say I'm better when muted. Anybody want to confirm they can hear me? No? Am I speaking to avoid? To avoid what? Okay, well, I'll assume you can hear me. Ah, does I've seen a yes in the chat. That's good then. That gives me a great deal of confidence. That's one of the things I don't like about these virtual sessions where you don't have a real audience to play to. Um, yeah, that was an old picture, sorry. And here's my COVID lockdown hair and today's T-shirt is Geek's Rule. I bought a whole load of T-shirts last year ready to present and then all this COVID stuff came in. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take your whirlwind tour with lots of demonstrations of the various or some of the various things we can automate in Citrix virtual apps and desktops. So specifically around that area rather than sort of Netscaler or Gen Server or anything like that. So without further ado, let's just do a quick sort of placement of why we want to do it. You know, once it's done, it's usually much quicker and more reliable because, uh, of course, human error is the biggest problem with uh, a lot of things. Take out the humans, then we're probably okay. And sort of repeatability. And it allows us to do things via scheduled tasks. So rather than having to do something at 2 o'clock in the morning, which you know, for some people is great because they might get paid overtime. For a lot of us, it's a case of, well, I really can't be bothered. So we can use built-in Windows scheduled tasks to do a lot of this stuff and then use email and you know, other methods of um, notifications if you want, you know, hook it into Slack or, dare I say, Teams and those sorts of things or uh, text messages. You know, there's lots of ways of putting notifications out. And there's a lot of stuff out there ready-made. So you might say, well, I'm not really a PowerShell scripty person where you know, somebody like myself does yeah, PowerShell pretty much every day, seven days a week, sometimes eight days a week. And... How do you know whether something's good or not? And that's that's the problem, of course. Because I might put a script out there and I go, yeah, I've tested it. It's all really good. And you say, well, it's from Guy. It must be really good and very well tested. And then I might just have missed something or not quite considered you know, your particular version or something that's out there. And you run it in your production environment and you could break 4,000 know, user sessions and that sort of thing. So sanity check it. Even if you don't understand what you know, everything's doing, you can probably look in there to see if it's trying to you know, copy large amounts of documents up to uh, up to a cloud or encrypt your files. And if you've got the luxury of a test environment, test it there first. What can we automate? Well, the builds themselves. You know, back in the day when I was doing Citrix builds in the 1990s, you know, when machines came with two gig of RAM and four processors, if you were very lucky, and we did everything manually. Then we started to automate it a bit. Of course, there's so many different ways you can automate the build itself. Uh, again, I'm not going to cover that here. What I will be talking about is creating sort of new endpoints with Citrix MCS and PVS. Good old reboot schedules. You know, obviously there's a lot built into CBAD itself, but they don't always suit everybody. You've got slightly different uh, criteria, so you can you know, roll your own. Good old updates because we like to update our machines, don't we? Well, we don't necessarily like to, but it's probably a good idea. But dirty word backups, so we can copy various bits of data into various whatever formats we want, rather than just taking, I mean, or you can take machine snapshots, but it, it just depends what you need to back up. But again, the more you automate it, great, but just test the recovery works before you actually come to rely on it, and your backup doesn't actually work at all. Uh, I do quite a lot of these for, for customers, particularly when, let's say, we find a bug in the product. You know, one I've, uh, a couple of years ago was to do with printing, and the problem we had was that you know, the spooler would basically die, but it couldn't be restarted, couldn't be killed, so we couldn't use that machine again. So again, something just periodically check the machines. If one of them had shown this particular problem by um, an event log entry, then we put it into maintenance mode, message the users. Next time we check, we have 15 minutes or so. If we haven't got the users, then we uh, reboot it and take it out of maintenance mode. So again, saves somebody having to do that manually. When you've got hundreds of machines, then it's much easier to do it that way. But I'm just going to turn my camera off to save a bit of bandwidth and to save my hair from uh, distracting people from the content. Uh, one of my scripts on GitHub, where there's sort of 100 scripts or terms of references in the slide deck, which will be available um, later, as well as the recording. Yeah, the popular one is for, you know, just running a daily health check, let's say at 7.30 and then you know, halfway through the day, just to say, you know, what machines have I got, what's not maybe not quite right, and just email it out. 
And again, that came about because a company I used to work for, people were doing that manually. It's like, really? Oh, the pain. And that's when I look across to see how I'm doing for time and realize I haven't started my PowerShell countdown. And so I'm five minutes in. So let's change that to a 40 minute. Again, this is all PowerShell, of course. Not very useful. And we just click run and then that will start counting down. And the same thing actually uses clocks. So, and I use this a lot in my testing and, and things because I can just hit mark, put a comment in. If I don't have to write on scraps of paper, I can come back to it and I can explore these things as well. Again, another utility on GitHub, but I find that very useful. Also do the net scaler stuff. I don't I don't do um, net scaler stuff. I find networks of storage very boring. I leave that to other people. It's enough on the desktop to keep me busy. And yeah, you know, pretty much look to automate anything that's you know time consuming or error prone or very boring. But if it's worthwhile, you know, if you're running, if, if you're doing something manually, you know, once a month and it takes ten minutes, but again, it's going to take you, let's say, two weeks to design, build, test, document it. Is it really worth it? Much as I love scripting, I won't always write a script to solve something or to implement something. If it's you know, the return on investment in terms of time or money, depending on what it's paid work, is isn't worth it. As much as it can be fun. But that's where the community comes in. You can write things, well, I can't really write this at work. This could be fun. Yep, do it. Works great. Okay, then share it. That's kind of where I started out. And you know, then you uh, just get distracted by the community and spend all your time doing that stuff. But PowerShell is my life. Okay, so let's actually crack in, or crack on, or just crack up, and talk about how we can uh, create new MCS endpoint devices with some demos as well, uh, assuming the screen sharing works, of course. Looking across, make sure I've uh, stopped the camera, not the uh, microphone. Although, again, I would say some people seem to think I sound better muted. Okay, so creating new MCS um, is actually very easy. It's kind of all built into uh, Citrix PowerShell, which means uh, yeah, literally half a dozen lines and we can create new machines. I mean, we can create a whole Citrix you know, site from the ground up with catalogs and delivery groups to publish desktops, all that sort of side of things. There's, there's a lot more to it than you might think. And I've got a script that I haven't quite released yet because something like that needs a lot of testing. So the idea being that you could dump out your existing site to you know, JSON with everything in it uh, and then be able to re-import it into, a, let's say, a test environment or another environment. Um, but here we're just going to talk about not creating from scratch, but let's say we've got scenarios. We've already got some MCS devices, but suddenly I need yeah, another 10 making, for instance. And so what will happen here is let me just uh, share my screen. Uh, I can remember how to do it, so I'm not very technical. Uh, pick the right screen, looks like that one. And then bring a window across. Well, hey, right. So here's just, well, this is my jump box. I mean, that's one of the things I've, uh, in the slide later on, which I probably won't get to, which is rather than doing these sorts of things on delivery controllers or storefront servers or anything that's got an you know, active role, Build yourself a jump box, as in you know, a server OS, so you can get multiple users connected to it, admin users, that is, and then install all the necessary PowerShell APIs, SDKs, consoles, etc. So this box has got PVS, console, studio, and it's got a utility I wrote so I can actually um, fire up studio against my two different um, delivery controllers because one's 1912 LTSR and one's uh, 2103 current release. Um, it's got PDS console, et cetera, et cetera, and all the, clan, all the PowerShell commandlets I need. So let's go to this, which actually isn't a script. Read that first line. This, again, is just you know, stuff that I can use uh, in demos using good old PowerShell ISD, none of this newfangled Visual Studio code with me. Again, mainly because I do a lot of coding on custom sites and could have coded what's available, which is you know, always ISE. 
So the first thing we need to do is actually create new AD accounts. So I'm going to say we've got already a you know, delivery group with MCS. So I'm going to use this to come um, delivery group. Play to the machine catalog so you can see at the moment it's got six machines in it uh, again we can view the machines if we wanted to begin to take a time and not to bother and uh, this is the ou where it puts them so let's create another couple of machines um so the first thing i would do is to copy and paste we'll just run that particular line and this is where we hit the first issue because I'm on a jump box, notice I said new accounts. And what we don't do is we see red and then run away screaming, going, uh, partial gave me an error, it's all wrong, your script's broken, help. Now, what we do is we actually read the error. Although it's not particularly descriptive, to be fair, in this case, invalid URL was given for the service. What does that actually mean? All that means here is because I'm on a jump box, it doesn't know what to communicate with. So in this case, it's a delivery controller. So what we do is we give it a map admin address. Again, notice as soon as I start typing, it puts it up there so I can just tab complete. And I've got a pointed at a delivery controller. Or we'll a load balance entity. Then I've got to think and talk at the same time, which for me is very difficult. So DDC02. But actually telling it um, to communicate with that delivery controller. So if you read Citrix documentation, in some places it says you only need to specify this admin address once, and after that it will remember what machine it's talking to. My experience is some of the commandlets, unless you explicitly put this in, won't know what machine, and you'll get the to talk to, so you get these errors. So I put it in to every uh, command. But you can use something called splatting, which is a hash table, which basically means you can define it in one place. So if you need to change it or add extra parameters, again, you can do it in one place. So let's do that. Hope that works. The demo gods are looking good today, which I probably jinxed myself. So that's assigned to this variable new accounts, a couple of new accounts. Of course, it has guy. Prove it. Okay. So we look at it. We see a successful account. So these are just properties to the objects, and we can see it's created. What it's told me it's going to do is to create these two new machines. Now, are those machines free? Yes. So we look in here. My naming scheme, which is GL S19 MCS, and then the numbers. So GLS19 MCS. You can see the last machines I had in there were nine and ten. Oh, by the way, you know, hopefully you know about creating um, toolbars. So the desktop toolbars. So you can see your desktop shortcuts, even when you've got Windows on top, and you can even turn off icon display on your desktop, clean desktop, and the desktop menu still works. And then you can also add the admin tools menu. Direct. So again, I've not had to manually build this. I've literally just created the toolbar, and I've uh, tweeted about that a while ago, so I can you know, bring up all my tools much more easily. So that makes sense. It's going to pick machines 11 and 12. Good. So I've not had to worry about going and finding those machines, finding what's free, etc. So I've got my new accounts, and then I can go ahead and actually make VMs with this uh, with this line we have here. So again, I'll put that to the clipboard. F8 it if I want that runs immediate, but then if we need to change the command line, it's easy to do it this way. So control V. Now I'm running this, I can run this asynchronously or I can run it synchronously. So if you're creating a lot, you might want to run it asynchronously, but then you have to um, look at the task and wait on the task to be finished. Slightly more complicated, but it can be faster. So in fact, let's go to our um, or my vSphere console. So here we can see at the moment, again, there's my existing MCS machine, 9 and 10, so notes we don't have an 11 and no recent tasks. Nothing up my sleeves, although you can't see that. Um, so let's do that. Has that actually given me something in this prov VM task? It has, it's given me a GUID as in yeah, an identifier. Notice down here now we've seen some tasks fire off in vCenter. So there's my reconfigure machine that I've had to create them from scratch. That's beauty of MTS, of course. Creating them from snapshots, 11 and 12. You can also change the snapshots. Uh, I've got a script on GitHub uh, for that as well, so you can automate it if you, uh, if you so desire. So that's created those two new machines. Are they in Active Directory yet? 
Yes, they are. Doing F5 in there. So there's, there's 11 and 12, so it's done all that for you. Next, we have a look at that task itself. So we get the B provisioning task. Uh, if I just minimize the script for a moment, we'll see all the, inf all the lovely information it gives us. Main thing is here, status finished. Completed. Uh, terminating error, and so terminating error, no terminating error. So that's, that's pretty good. So that's what we want. So that has now created those machines. But what it hasn't done is actually put them into the catalog. So if we go to the machine catalog, that, uh, those are our members of, we do view the machines. There's my nine and 10, but even with the refresh, I have no 11 and 12. So what's going on? But it's created the VMs here in, uh, here in this, these and this will work across any hypervisor that you've already uh, configured within uh, CVAD. So that's my, uh, my vSphere. So now we actually have to add them to the catalogs. So just for convenience, I can get my catalog there, but I don't actually need it. So then the main thing here is task details, created virtual machines. So we can see that down here, created virtual machines. So there's my 11 and 12 again. What I'm going to do is for each of those, I'm going to call the Citrix command look, you broke a machine, and machine name, I have to use a SID, but again, I've got the SID in there. The catalog ID, again, I'm calling get broke catalog, but I could have assigned it to a variable, and I've decided here, I'm actually going to set them into, uh, into maintenance mode. After I'm going to change that. False, I can actually spell false, so, then at the end, again, that's why it's kind of a placeholder. It's one of the main things with PowerShell. I did uh, a PowerShell session entitled Writing Robust PowerShell, and one of the key takeaways from that is always check error status of things. So we'll do that. And again, this is a case in point. Notice that failed to connect the back end server. server mate, why is that? Well, because it hasn't actually remembered what uh, machine, what delivery controller to uh, run this against. So we quickly put that in there. As long as the get broker catalog works, of course, I might have to put it in there. I'll put it in there as well. Ah, I'll put it in those. If I can address get. get. Good idea, I'm losing the plot. It's got my own initials then. What some people do call me a get. Uh, XADDC2. Machine name is no well done guy. So let's do let's switch into troubleshooting mode. See what's gone wrong there. I'll figure it out yeah, in enough time I'll actually move on. Uh, with... Oh great. I've lost my class details. Fantastic. <clears throat> so for some reason, my variable has gone, so I haven't got those machines. So what would have happened? I did all this yesterday in my rehearsal. Of course, it all worked. Yes, of course, it did, Guy. That would have created the virtual machines uh, in the catalog. So we'd have seen the two machines in the catalog. And once we've got the machines in the catalog, you can simply add them to your desktop group. Desktop group being a delivery group, slight difference in nomenclature between uh, Citrix uh, API or PowerShell and um, what we see in Studio. And we don't actually tell it the specific machines. So here we don't tell it we want to add machines 11 and 12, but that's the same if you remember back to the uh, Citrix Studio that you get when you say you want to add new machines. You don't pick the machines, you just you know, pick the catalog and say how many machines. And as long as there's that many unassigned machines, it will add them. So that's effectively in one, two, three, four steps, how I can create, go from no, you know, no VMs or no extra VMs to having you know, new VMs within uh, a delivery group ready. And if I set maintenance mode to you know, false, which is the default, then they're actually ready to go once they're powered on. 
So almost a demo that worked. Let's move the uh, B sphere out of the way. Uh, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, I've just come back to the chat now, media player. Yeah, all my demos are live, as you can probably tell now, you know, this uh, recorded video stuff. So again, the slides just kind of back this back this up that I've just been uh, showing, so we'll, get, we'll skip through all those. Uh, it does work, believe me. Um, and then there's actually a link to a, a blog post I wrote for Script Runner that goes through that in more detail and links to the links to a script that will do it as well. So again, the usual sort of thing that, yeah. <laughs> Somebody's pro if you think about it, something you need to do, you think, well, oh, surely somebody's done that already. Then, yeah, they probably have. So it's a case of knowing where to look, which is usually you know, GitHub or posting one of the forums, somewhere like that. So creating a new PBS device, is that the same guy? Uh, no, <laughs> it's quite different, unfortunately. Whereas PBS is still probably one of my favorite secret products, going you know, right back from you know, even before it was owned it, when it was called Arden, if you can remember uh, that far back, some of you. It's a little bit more involved, should we say. So what do we do? Well, <laughs> we don't have that nice, easy mechanism say, telling Citrix to create the Active Directory account and find out what's free. So we have to do it ourselves. So we can either use the Active Directory module, or you could do it manually, of course. You go and look in your AD and go, oh, yes, these are the next five machines I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use, earmark them or manually create them or whatever you would do in your organization. Um, again, the script that I wrote um, that will do all this for you. Some of you may have seen me uh, publicise it on Twitter a bit. Um, we'll find all the you know, free, free machines for you. And you know, if they're not all consecutive, you know, so if you, machines 10 and 11 and 15 are already used, but 12, 13, 14 aren't, then you know, it will pick out you know, 12, 13, 14, 16, 17, for instance. And cross check, of course, to uh, VMware or your hypervisor, etc. To make sure they don't exist there. So I'm just going to quick drink. Non alcoholic, of course. It's not where I turn my camera off, others. So we can use you know, PowerShell. I use ADSI. Why? Because it means I don't have to rely on the Active Directory module. It's a little bit more uh, perverse, should we say, to you syntax wise, but again, plenty of examples out there. So we create, we find our new machine names. We actually create the VM within our hypervisor. So again, in this case, is uh, for me in my lab is, is VMware. So I create the VM there. There isn't the equivalent again. If you remember back to MCS, we would actually go up Citrix to create the VMs for, VMs for us, and it talk to the hypervisor. No, here what we have to do is create the VMs. So I use a uh, vSphere template that I've got. Again, it's just got my you know, uh, persistent D drive and you know, event logs configured to push there, as well as the overflow cache and uh, page file. We then add it to PVS. So again, I'm using the uh, PVS command that's which is separate to the CVAD ones. They, as we'll say later in the slide deck, although I won't get to those slides. Uh, you can have them as reference. We get those command looks for PVS because we've got the PVS console. Uh, you can see my on 24 screen now. Right, okay. So I stopped sharing, don't I? There, schoolboy error. Not very good with technology. That's what I said. And yet, I've even got the uh, attendee view in another window. So then I can say, yeah, but I'm also not looking at that either. Yeah, don't get old, folks. Um, okay, so hopefully we're back to uh, just being able to see that rather than uh, the team chat. Good job I didn't put anything um, yes in the chat. So we now need to add the machines to PVS, which we can do through those PVS commandlets. So we first of all need to create a new device in PVS. So we do that with a, a new PVS device via its MAC address. So that's the key here. We have to get the, uh, the MAC address from the VM. So the new VM within VMware Power CLI returns a, a, a VM object, and we can call a, a get network adapter. So that's again is a Power CLI, a commandlet that will give us the MAC address. So we can feed that into new PVS device, saying, "Hey, here's a new machine name with this particular MAC address." But new PVS device doesn't actually assign us any disks. So we then have to find the disk. You know, the existing you know, PVS disk that we've got in our store and assign it to that new device. 
then we add it to the domain. We, at least we don't have to add the domain ourselves through uh, the Active Directory PowerShell. As long as you, again, you've got it configured correctly in you know, PVS for domain join, then you can just call our PVS device to domain. That's one saving grace. I'm just clicking the right place. And then we're back to doing the same sorts of things that we do with MCS. So we call new broker machine or so the except there's a slight complication here in that what uh, new broker machine with MCS, we literally just gave it the machine SID, SID, so the name. Here, we actually have to tell it the hypervisor connection UID, as in which particular of my hypervisor connections, if you've got multiple, is it, and what is the UID of the machine itself, which is a bit painful. Again, I'm not going to go into the detail here for the sake of time, but the script that I wrote, all 1,000 plus lines of it, um, to support this and do this uh, has got that in it. So if you're interested to see how it's done, yeah, get hold of that script and, uh, and pull it apart. And of course, because it's on GitHub, if you think, oh, guy, you've done this wrong or you want to make some improvements or add some functionality, that's the beauty of GitHub. Pull request, make changes, push it back to the community, share it with the community. More than happy for people to do that. And then we add it to the delivery group. Again, in exactly the same way we did with the MCS. So these last two steps are pretty much the same other than this complication of the hypervisor. Um, so, yeah, okay. Sorry, just being sidetracked by a message. Like most blokes, I can't multitask. Um, so I'm not really, I'm not gonna really demo this as such because it will take too long given all the steps. But if I click on here, again, at the bottom, you see there's a, yeah, a link to a script, well, uh, a blog post that goes into more detail on all the steps required. And also then there's a script at the bottom hosted by Script Runner that will uh, allow you to do this. And I've had a few of my fellow CTPs test it for me. So as per a lot of my scripts, it takes quite a lot of parameters, most of which you don't need to uh, specify yourself. Uh, let me share my screen so if I can manage that again this time, just very briefly I'll show you uh, that. And then bring. No, that didn't work. Oh. No, and it did work, but it was slow, and I've now just cancelled it. Wow, this is going well, isn't it, guy? You really are a good guy, yes. Let's hope there's no feedback forms. Uh, at this point, I'd normally tell a joke, but uh, again, I can't multitask. So let's try to start the screen share again. <sighs> She'll cry shortly. It's okay. Turn the camera off so you won't see the tears. Right then. So, well, here's the uh, the MCS one where I say, okay, this isn't the full script, lots of parameter blocks and options and so on. It's all a bit hard coded. Oh, there's the new PVS device one. Is uh, um, what is it? Says it's screen sharing. Is it catching up? Oh, yes, it is catching up. <coughs> so I'm not again. We're not going to go into detail. But we can see right at the top. Yeah, all the comment block going to help people. There's only a few managed parameters, but again, when writing a script, rather than hard code any string or anything in there at all, just make it a parameter, like we've got an example here. And just give it a default value. So if somebody doesn't specify it, then you can just give it a, a default rather than you know, not using the parameter block and then people are actually having to change the script when they want to customize it for their own use. Um, pros and cons of both approaches. It's easier perhaps with, without parameters to use it in a scheduled task. But if you know what you're doing, again, there's a slide later on about putting this into into scheduled tasks. So, for instance, if we look at the look for a museum call that can search up, this is where we're using Power CLI to create a new VM from the template that we specified. Again, the template being uh, an argument into the script. Then we, as I said, we get the network adapter so we can get its MAC address. If it's got multiple NICs, then again, there's a parameter to tell it which network, uh, if you've got a separate PVS network to, to use, then we uh, create the new PVS device, as I said. Then we add a disk to it. 
Notice again, lots of error catching, which is quite important to make sure that yeah, everything's broke, uh, everything hasn't broken rather, unlike my presentation, so that we can see that um, if we've told it to create 10 new virtual machines, because uh, I need them in my you know, delivery group, then it has created 10 machines and there's not been a problem somewhere along the line. You know, a lot of scripts I get into you know, QA for people or, or just look at generally, you know, tend to skip on the error handling. You know, okay, it makes the script a lot longer, but yeah, you know, makes it more robust. That's what I'm saying. Is you know, if you're going to automate stuff and give stuff to people in your organisation, say, yeah, I wrote this. So, well, yeah, last time you wrote it, it took you ten attempts to get it right, and we had you know four P1 outages because you didn't test it properly. Yeah. So error checking is key to making something you know, reliable when it's important. And here you see we do the add PBS to the domain, then we get it, adding it to catalogs and so on. Uh, but I won't, uh, won't demonstrate that. Okay, let's stop sharing my screen. So that, that's uh, PBS. So if you want to configure or change the you know, settings, you know, potentially in delivery groups, on machine catalogs or elsewhere within CVAD, something else we can automate. You know, let's put all these machines into maintenance mode at whatever time because we're going to patch them or you know, whatever else we want to do. So we can do various things. So as with most PowerShell commandlets, there are get commands and there are set commands. So we can set machines themselves individually. Or we can actually set it at the uh, delivery group level. So you can put a whole delivery group into maintenance mode if you want. Or you can disable it, which is actually something you can't do currently, as far as I'm aware. Well, probably not up to later versions in Studio, but you can do in PowerShell. And the advantage being if you set it a uh, delivery group to disabled, so enabled dollar false, then what we're doing is actually meaning it doesn't show in the storefront when a user logs on, whereas if it's in maintenance mode, the user will still see, see that delivery group. And if it's the delivery group itself, which is in maintenance mode, then they'll get an error when they launch it. So I prefer to disable uh, delivery groups. I'll come back to the questions at the end, if I may. Um, we can also make changes to catalogs. So, so anything you can do in Studio and more, you can do through PowerShell. So quite often when I'm doing things with tags, for instance, because tags are a nice, powerful feature, uh, I'll do it through PowerShell. It's so much easier than trying to navigate around you know, Studio to do that. Then we can start to do some admin stuff if we want. So let's say you know, there's a problem with a particular machine. Maybe I've detected it through a script automatically, through an event log entry or a process or... Uh, running or not running, you know, lots of ways we can detect it. So I've used set broken machine to put the machine itself into maintenance mode. Might be that I then need to ask the users to log off and log back on again so that they log off and then we'll log back onto a, a different server in the farm. So I could use something like send broken message and uh, then either, well, probably, you know, in that case, stop the broker session. Uh, I could uh, I've just left disconnect on there as, a, as an example as well. So let's, um, why is that slide the same title? Why on back? Uh, no, oh, that should be number two, that's why. So we can look at sessions. Again, this, what, what does filter left speed mean? It means uh, if you're familiar with PowerShell, you can pipe stuff through where object or the question mark, uh, which is a uh, alias where object, but again, don't use that in scripts because it makes them more difficult to understand, particularly for non-PowerShell savvy people. Then the further left we go, the more efficient it is. You know, for instance, if you've got 3,000 concurrent user sessions and you do a get broker session and pipe it through where username equals, it has going to return all 3,000 sessions and pipe it through that where. Whereas if you say get broker session minus username, it will only return that, what you know, the, the sessions that match that Username. In fact, let's again do a screen share. This is where probably I should have just stuck with a screen share the whole time and used PowerPoint natively. But uh, yeah, hindsight's wonderful, isn't it? In fact, the only exact sight. So let's get rid of that. that. Get back over here. Uh, so again, here I'm running as a, I'm running 
as a domain admin, but I'm not elevated. So my usual test is if I'm running elevated, run the filter driver manager control program. So we'll pass some filter drivers, because if you're not elevated, then you get access denied. So if I do a get broker session, go on, let's get this keyboard fixed. Well, that's not a lot of use, is it? All that information. Well, we can do things a number of different ways. We can select uh, specific properties. So if I use PowerShell's system history, so I actually go through previous commands. Uh, so we can see there's one I will use in a minute. Sending a broker message. Uh, I can look at specific machine. Yes, so I can say, oh, who's logged on to that particular machine or machine range? Here's where I'm using it. So here's the example of filtering the left. So let's see if my user Billy Bob is logged on. Uh, that's called Live and Let Die, the Bond film. That's where that user came from. So I'm selecting a, a just a small number of properties. Well, how did I know what properties to select? Well, again, the easy way to do stuff is just a select star pipe through outgrid view or OGV alias because that will just show things. Yeah, it's not very busy in my lab at the moment. I've got one user session, which is uh, over here. I need to get my user bit bulb on that particular machine. So I set it ready for the uh, for the demo. So you can see all the properties. So in that select, I can select whatever I'm interested in. A wealth of information, but then I can do things like uh, just bring this over. Yeah, ready. Uh, let's do a send. So here we go. I send to now. Notice here in that command, I don't need to know what machine they're on. Yeah. So I'm just saying to see that I find out what machine or machines if they logged on to multiple sessions. This user's logged on to and send them. A, uh, and send a message, which then comes out like that. Or what I could do is to you know, pipe that through stop broker session to, to log them off. Or I could do a bro get broker session on the machine name. And the machine needs to be domain qualified mcs01 and how many were there of those screen folder information just pipe it through measure I can just pipe it through select uh username other things uh but then what i could do of course is then pipe it through send broker message and do the same thing so that message all users on that machine so again you can could do this part of automation. You might want to do this through sort of director or studio. A lot of the time, particularly large environments, I find it easy to do it through PowerShell. I suppose it's somebody who can read a bit like somebody who can read matrix code. Um, so what else can we do? Well, we say we can get get broken machine. Type in the right window. That's always useful, I find. Which is something that you might not be aware of, rather than notice. Uh, you know, you can tab through arguments, see what's available, what sort of things you can filter on, but you can also use control space, which will actually list everything, and it will warn you when there's over 100. Because there's over 134 parameters that you could give to get broken machine. Makes my script for PVS devices, which has 36, quite small. So I've said yes. So these are all the ones you've got available notice it puts me in uh, alphabetical order so i could say you know when when the last connection time was and i could actually use a date range rather than a specific time all these sorts of things but notice i'm using the cursor key to go through them yeah so well you probably can't see me pressing the cursor key unless you've got a camera in my office if you're looking around paranoid i can do all sorts of things from here so that's how you can discover as well as course what another thing you can do to understand what the commandlets are is to you know, run get help and we give it a minus show window and then it'll pop up in a window and give you you know all the options command line examples etc or it can it will take an on miners online as well and go actually go to a web page as long as you can get to the internet from where you're running that machine so again a good way to um 
find out what commands you've got available, but also, you know, what, what else can I do with sessions? Well, we can use get command for all Citrix modules, and we can say, you know, what are the commands which you've got the word session in them? There you go. So those are all the ones which got session in. So some actually to do with that V there, some to do with session recordings, setting various session things. So that's how we can explore a module rather than having to RTFM as in look at rather boring online documentation. We can sort of second guess that if we want something, it's going to have session into it. Another way we can work out what is going on uh, from a PowerShell perspective is within Studio itself. So if you go to the root of Studio, you'll find there's a PowerShell tab. Now, the problem usually is trying to find something interesting. So there we go. There was some stuff. So you can see at 2.30, two days ago, it was doing a get broken machine on something. But anyway, if I go and let's me go and make a change. So let's go and change. So here you can see some disabled. You know, when I was talking about setting uh, set uh, broker desktop group, we don't have any way to enable from here. But again, I can just do it you know, with a set broker desktop group minus enable dollar true in PowerShell. So let's just make a change here. So let's say I want to automate. I've made a mistake and I want to set, I want to untick that in box, for instance. How do I do that in PowerShell? Well, I could try Google and looking around or .go or if I really um, not wanting to find it, I can use Bing. But what we're going to now do is go back to our PowerShell and find another thing. There we go, 1926. There you go. <clears throat> set broker access rule. So more of a start high level operation, get log sites, stop high level. They're all for the logging and the auditing. Again, actually logging and auditing is something we can get at through uh, PowerShell if we want to. So you can send a, a weekly report of various types of events if you wanted to, you know, CSV format or whatever else. So that's how we do it. So in depending on how you're doing it, you might want to use a bearer token um, or if you're running it as an AD account who is, you know, got the right level of permission via administrators, then, or just use pass-through authentication of that account. Uh, again, there's some notes on that in the slide deck, which I'm definitely not going to get to. So let's stop that screen share. Come back to the slides. I'm always very ambitious in what I'm going to get through. Now let's stop the session. Thank you. Okay, guys. Hey, Tom Wynn here. Uh, hey, so thank you so much. I think uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, slide forward a little uh, just to stay stay within our time. Are you, will you be around to answer questions um, in the group chat there? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Yep. So uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, John Worthington from EG Innovations. Well, thank you, Tom, and uh, appreciate you giving me a few minutes to uh, – uh, tell everyone about uh, our company. Uh, uh, EG Innovations uh, is uh, uh, a uh, strong uh, Citrix partner, and uh, I'm uh, currently the director of uh, customer success for EG. Um, if you have any questions, stop by our booth. We'd be happy to uh, uh, answer any questions you have. It'll be manning the booth with some of our colleagues. And if you're there, uh, don't forget to opt in to win uh, some wireless earbuds and uh, potentially get a $10 gift certificate. Uh, we, uh, EG Innovations as a company has had a strong uh, technology partnership with Citrix for well over a decade now. And uh, Citrix is using EG as the exclusive performance monitor for all their major trade shows, as well as the global demonstration centers, which is in a multi-cloud uh, deployment model. And we continue to hear from the Citrix admins that uh, they like not only our depth and breadth of Citrix uh, domain uh, expertise, but the ability to include non-Citrix tiers uh, as well. Uh, we, hear, we hear that from Citrix admins uh, uh, all the time. When we started more than two decades ago, we were monitoring web applications. We, we met uh, uh, some guy named Drew in New Jersey who was a MetaFrame expert and uh, 
uh, got into a Citrix. That's what started our journey. And what's interesting is uh, our core analytics have uh, really a proven ability to adapt to changing technologies, uh, including Citrix and, and others. And uh, the ability to monitor the digital user experience today is really uh, the key. And I think this uh, Forrester uh, uh, quote says it all, 98% of user experience problems really rely on several parts of the IT uh, infrastructure. And this creates uh, significant uh, challenges for performance monitoring. You need to monitor endpoints, edge networks, log on performance, um, really all digital workspace uh, ecosystem components. And at the same time, and within a user uh, context, um, monitor workloads, uh, which includes uh, enterprise applications, microservices, public clouds, and so on. And EG Innovations has really been on this journey for, again, two decades now. And uh, what we uh, have, uh, the, the really, uh, the heart of the architecture is an embedded analytics that's based on top to bottom dependencies and end to end data flows that correlates every layer of every component and isolates which layer of which component is the source of performance anomaly, whether it's latency at the uh, user end or, or uh, some part of the Citrix infrastructure or Active Directory or whatever. Uh, and so uh, that's really uh, the key uh, to the analytics. We also include a fully supported uh, script library, uh, or you can uh, uh, write your own. Uh, uh, we've, we've had a command line interface for a number of years now. We've also got a REST API, so you can begin to automate your operations, including uh, self-healing uh, capabilities for automatic uh, re remediation, as well as um, uh, automated administration uh, of the monitor. We also include an optional integration console that allows you to build new layer models as, as needed uh, to integrate, again, end-to-end -end monitoring, uh, monitoring uh, as, uh, as required. Uh, so this is really what gives us uh, from uh, uh, visibility, what we call total vis visibility from workspaces to workloads. And this is really what you're gonna need uh, as we move into the customer experience world. This 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 user experience is now table stakes. Uh, and that's what we've done really for, for two decades. This is what you missed this morning. Um, I will uh, try to catch uh, you guys up here. So I'm moving through this quickly. So stop by our booth if you have questions, but um, it, what, you, what you'll be able to see later today is uh, multi-cloud ecosystems. We're gonna give another a demo, live demo at the booth. Um, we've got a little bit about how we monitor Citrix in an IGL Nutanix uh, uh, environments. Uh, we'll be give, doing some executive overviews and we've got a segment on automating IT operations with EG Innovations as well. So uh, again, uh, tried to catch you up uh, guys as, as quickly as I could. Uh, I would encourage people to please uh, please stop by the booth, ask some questions, uh, get engaged, and uh, we hope to see you there. That's it for me, folks. Thank you very much. Are we there? All right, thank you, John. Uh, next yep. up is Goliath, so welcome, Stacy. Not sure if I spoke a little too early, uh, but here is Stacy with Goliath Technologies. Tom, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Man, these tech issues, right? <laughs> so let me try this again. Um, I wanted to kind of start off by saying there's not enough experts like yourselves out there. So we actually collaborated with Citrix and we published these numbers together. There's roughly 400,000 Citrix customers globally. And the recommendation, which some of you may laugh at, 
is to have two to three experts per one of those customers. So the demand's about 1.2 million. But if you look at who's actually available to support these clients, there's only roughly a little over 50,000 certified experts out there. And so the supply is simply not there. And what happens then? One, you have a number of IT generalists that are trying to troubleshoot and monitor that user experience on Citrix. And they simply don't have the background or the years of experience to really be able to talk, for example, to the network team and discuss that while the network looks fine to them, there's not enough bandwidth allocated to Citrix and in order to support the applications that users are using. The other thing that happens is experts like yourselves are spending way too much time troubleshooting individual user issues and not enough time being proactive in bringing in some of the latest and greatest technologies, evaluating things like Citrix Cloud or WVD. And the reality is that we're never gonna solve this problem. There's never gonna be enough experts out there. And so what Goliath has done working with our clients, working with Citrix CTPs, is we've built purpose-built software to monitor and troubleshoot that end user experience with embedded intelligence and automation, which means we can proactively identify your entire Citrix infrastructure. We have hundreds of monitors built in that will identify any failure point condition or IT element that could negatively impact user experience. And we will alert you anytime those thresholds are potentially exceeded based on industry best practices from Citrix, VMware, Microsoft, even our own experience over the last several years of consulting. It's with that software that we truly help IT pros anticipate, troubleshoot, and document issues to help transform from reactive to proactive. And the challenge is, is the pandemic, as so many people have talked about, has not help these issues. In fact, they have doubled the workload probably for many of you. And you're probably already feeling some of the stress as individuals start to go back home or back to the office. Now you've got users at the office having one experience, users at home having another, and they want to want know, why is my user experience different? Why does Citrix work different? Well, the reality is nothing has to do with Citrix. So we just launched today the next release of Goliath Performance Monitor, and in that we've introduced many new enhancements to help solve some of those challenges. We've added new troubleshooting features for the remote worker so that you can visually see, and we all interpret that data for you, when any of the performance metrics are exceeding industry standards, specifically around ICA and HDX. So you can identify, is the issue home Wi-Fi? Is it user behavior? We've simplified the way that you as an IT pro can drill into the ICA channels and really identify is a user having poor session performance because they're using too much bandwidth with audio, video, graphically intense programs, or third-party peripheral devices. We've added support for Citrix Cloud. And with our Citrix Cloud Connector module, we're not only monitoring and alerting around the infrastructure of Citrix Cloud, but those cloud connectors. So if a connector goes down, we can alert you that one of those services were down. We can automatically remediate it by restarting that service. And that way users are never impacted. What our clients tell us is by using our new Citrix Cloud Connector module, they have the same visibility and control they had when it was on premise, but the convenience of leveraging Citrix Cloud. One of our most highly anticipated features that was just launched is our new end user experience scorecard. With everyone being remote, Management really was asking, what is our overall experience? How do we benchmark against industry best practices? How do we compare the user experience in the office versus at home? So with this new scorecard, you can automatically benchmark your performance against industry standards. If you do see metrics that are yellow or red, we don't roll up our data, which means that you can drill in and see which users are causing that metric to be increased, which might be giving you a poor score. So you can address the issues extremely quickly. Now we've already hit a number of these demos at the booth today, but if you do have time, please stop by the booth. We're gonna be continuing to demo our capabilities that I just gave you a quick glimpse on. And if you see something here and you weren't able to stop by, just go ahead and email techinfo at goliathtechnologies.com. We'll be happy to set up a free consultation, a demo, or a free trial for 30 days. Tom, thank you, and that's it for me.
All right. Thanks so much for that, Stacey. Um, so that concludes uh, this, uh, this this section of the, the Excel. Uh, next up will be Kevin Nardone with Citrix, and you can get to his session uh, via the lobby. Thanks, everyone, for joining.